Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the first Cancer Center seminar of the academic year. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Glenn Simmons, Jr., who will be our speaker today. Um, Dr. Simmons received his undergraduate degree in biology at the University of South Florida in Tampa, um, and then he followed this with a PhD in biomedical science and, and a minor in virology at Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. He then completed two postdoctoral fellowships, one in cancer epigenetics at Louisiana State University, and a second in lipid metabolism at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. He was then recruited to the University of Minnesota Duluth to join the faculty as an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences, um, where he's been a member of the Cancer Center and also involved in research. Um, his two main areas of research include altered metabolism and inflammation and how they relate to cancer development. And then he has a second line of research that's really focused on the role of biology and health disparities. Um, and the second area of research is the, the reason we've invited him to be our first speaker in the Community Outreach and Engagement Seminar Series that we're hosting this year. And he's here today to talk to us about his work on a culturally responsive health promotion to address health disparities in African-American men. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Simmons. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. There we go. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to share my research with you all today. Um, this, as Jen pointed out, is uh, definitely my other side of my research uh, activity within the university. And uh, as such, I rely heavily upon collaborations with very uh, well-established individuals in the uh, field of community-based participatory research. And because this research does eventually kind of dovetail with the bench science that I'm interested in doing, it was a natural fit for me to kind of engage in this work uh, once I joined the university. So today, I'm going to share with you all a pilot program uh, that we launched back in 2018 to look at ways of engaging communities of color, specifically African-American men, in areas where the normal resources um, aren't readily available that you may leverage in order to do these types of uh, outreach activities. Here we go. All right. So as many of us uh, on this uh, in this webinar are probably aware, uh, people of color in the United States experience worse health outcomes based on any number of health status measures. Here is some data uh, collected by the Kaiser Family Foundation that shows that uh, several populations within the United States uh, ex experience worse outcomes um, when compared to uh, non-Hispanic uh, non white Americans or Americans of European ancestry, uh, another way of, of, of saying that. And so we know that these things exist and this has pretty much been uh, the case for as long as we've been measuring uh, the health outcomes of individuals in the United States that people of color have uh, historically have had a, a, a worse go at um, uh, achieving you know, optimum health outcomes. Now you combine this with what we are now looking at the future of the United States. Uh, it's projected that by 2050, the population of the United States will ultimately become a majority minority um, is one uh, a term that's been utilized recently. Um, so basically the population will be uh, at least 50% people of color. So that to me indicates that we have kind of a confluence of two major things. We have ongoing health disparities in so-called minority populations, but then we also have these same populations becoming the dominant, the larger um, proportion of the population, which basically puts us in a situation where we have the, a recipe for disaster if we don't address these things in a meaningful way soon. Now, the work that we're interested in uh, in my lab, my co collaborators and myself is focused on the African-American um, uh, community. However, I think a lot of the work that we're doing, you could really kind of pivot and ask similar questions and take similar approaches looking at different populations, uh, different subgroups such as uh, indigenous populations um, uh, within Minnesota as well. So it's not that we are unaware that there are other populations we could look at, but this is where we decided to focus. 
Now, the reason for that focus is by and large because African Americans have almost have become synonymous with health disparities. Whenever you have that conversation, more often than not, individuals will immediately think of minority populations, and a lot of times, African Americans come to mind. So when you look at diseases like high blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, uh, kidney diseases, you see that African Americans, by and large, have an increased uh, likelihood of, of coming down with these particular diseases. And when you look at all-cause mortality um, rates, African Americans tend to be ahead of the pack um, in those circumstances as well. So it's not that this is something that we just picked out of nowhere. We know that this is an ongoing issue and the stats continue to tell us that we haven't done a lot of things meaningfully to address these, these issues and, and stop them where they, um, stop them from increasing. Now, this is looking at more of a national kind of a question, a national uh, uh, focus, but it, this isn't something that is only at the national level. Even in Minnesota, we know that this is ultimately a, a major issue. And one of the things that I think is important to understand for those of you who are kind of, you know, only seeing Minnesota from a Twin Cities um, perspective, well, it's no longer just going to be talking about the Twin Cities when you're talking about looking at helping communities of color, because over time it's been shown or projected that the rest of the state is eventually going to become significantly more diverse. And this is happening now. So this isn't something that's projected off into the future. I mean, even some of these so-called rural communities are starting to look at least um, a, a significant percentage of that, those populations, those communities are going to start to have populations that they haven't had um, you know, in, the, in those areas uh, for most of their history. So we need to learn how to engage. We need to learn how to make sure resources are getting to everyone in an equitable manner. Now, looking more closely to the area in which I'm currently located in the um, Duluth, St. Louis County area, we know that this issue has already been something that's been on the radar for healthcare officials um, uh, here in Duluth. And so when looking at a, a set of uh, health measures back in 2010, it was shown that people of color have shorter life expectancies in Duluth and in St. Louis County in general. And this is compared to individuals within the county, and this is also compared to folks throughout the state. So it looks to me that we know that this issue is something that is really coming, it, it really hits home. We need to understand how to engage communities of color. We need to understand how to, how to implement and, and get resources into their hands so that the health outcomes that we are currently experiencing, these health disparities, can be addressed in, in a meaningful way in real time and not, keep, you know, and not constantly being kind of a kick down the road for someone else to address. And when we look at the African-American community, we understand that it's not just one community. We have different outcomes for different individuals. And in particular, African-American men have been statistically shown to have shorter life expectancies compared to basically everyone else. Um, as a matter of fact, African-American men have a shorter life expectancy compared to just about every other population demographic within the United States, with few exceptions. And so that has been associated with higher uh, burdens of various diseases and also with other social uh, socioeconomic conditions um, playing a factor as well. So we can't ignore that, but we know that these things exist. And so we, we've basically taken it upon ourselves to ask questions, how do we, uh, how do we get help to African-American men and how do we really understand the layers of issues that, that exist that are preventing African-American men from being able to access health care and to improve uh, health, uh, healthy behaviors um, and related to these various diseases uh, that are listed here. Now, when we talk about addressing health disparities, it's not as though no one has been doing fantastic work in this area. As a matter of fact, the idea of addressing health disparities has become synonymous with early diagnosis, screenings, and even just making sure that individuals understand how to manage the diseases that they have been uh, diagnosed with. And so this is something that's become, again, just kind of the, the normal vocabulary for health disparities work. And 
the interesting thing about that is that it's also become extremely um, closely related, closely tied to the idea of centering these activities, these outreach events around culturally centered activities. So the clergy, churches have become um, a very good resource for doing outreach activities within the African-American community. Barbershops and salons, a study done um, in 2018, I believe down at, uh, with the Cleveland Clinic, has showed that engagement with African-American men utilizing barbershops as a vehicle, as a vehicle, as, as a conduit for getting information into the hands of the community showed tremendous success. And then we also know that things like sporting events also can be used as kind of a, a go-between to get the uh, health information from the experts into the hands of the folks who need it. So we know that these things work, but that's under very specific cir circumstances where these types of activities are accessible. And that's where the work that we've done here in Duluth starts to come in. Now, again, understanding the idea of addressing health disparities and working in, in, in the and hand in hand with communities is something that's not just something that we understand here in Minnesota or folks understand in Ohio. We know that this is a national priority. So this is coming from the highest levels of the medical, uh, medical research infrastructure. So NIH has pushed time and time again that we need to do more to increase the, in, uh, the participation and the interaction of, of people of color and specifically African-Americans in, in the context of this particular presentation uh, with research, with research questions, with healthcare uh, professionals so that we can, one, understand where the problems lie, but then also make sure that we can do things that are more preventative because as opposed to just treating symptoms, wellness is really the goal. We wanna make sure that people remain healthy and not have to engage the healthcare system under crisis basically seeing the emergency rooms as their primary care um, uh, type of uh, solution as, a, as opposed to, you know, having that long lasting community type of interaction with healthcare providers. Um, and so even though we know that these things are happening, we know that we need to engage, we know that there are different ways to engage when you're looking at communities of color, uh, most of these organizations, uh, private and, and, and public, are still not achieving their goal, though this goal has been something that's been stated for well over a decade now. I think personally, and, and I believe my, my collaborators and, and colleagues would agree with me, um, that we have a bit of an issue where we have a way that we want to do things or that our research kind of demands things to be done, but it doesn't always fit with the communities that we're working with. So there's a quote that I got from Peter Drucker. I don't know how many of you are into uh, management, uh, but Peter Drucker has this idea about how you work with things and how you work with people. And so I came, I came up with my own version of this quote, be efficient with things and be effective with people and not the other way around. Don't get those confused because there are times in which we try to do things a certain way, but it doesn't always work with people. You have to be a little bit more, um, flexible with people in order to make sure that you are effective with people. And so the reason I say this is because when you look at places outside of the metroplex of Minneapolis and St. Paul, there are very few identifiably African American centered spaces. There are very few what we call black spaces. These are places where folks tend to gather where they have significant history. These are kind of the nucleating points for that community. Well, in many places, including Duluth, those places either don't exist or never existed um, for various reasons. And we won't get into that uh, just at this point. And so when we started trying to do outreach in Duluth, that was our first major hurdle. Because even though there are historically, um, say churches that were founded uh, by African Americans, at this point in time, the African American community has very little interaction with that particular institution. And so you tend to find African American populations within the Duluth, um, uh, Southern St. Louis County uh, areas, they usually are more centrally located around these affordable housing complexes, these neighborhoods, but nowhere else. And 
that became an issue. But then also, in addition to that, not having these spaces, we also had to acknowledge that not being able to get to the places where people were due to inclement weather was also a major, a major issue. And so that basically kind of encapsulates the previous slide where we had to do things differently. It couldn't be a cookie cutter, one size fit all approach in order to be effective when engaging uh, this particular community. And we already know the laundry list of things that are already problematic when it comes to engaging communities of color. Um, we know that particularly in the African-American uh, communities, we know that there is a history of medical mistrust that goes all the way black back to slavery, to when enslaved Africans were experimented upon in, in, for better, uh, uh, the better part of uh, a century, at, at least, we have documentation of, of that. And people you know, may not have that information completely accurate, but there is a sense that that happened at some point and that it still continues to happen. And things like people uh, accessing free vaccines and, and, and being able to get medical treatment is all tied up in their, their reluctance to get those things is tied up in this history of medical mistrust. We also know that people having little understanding of what is being done in the research also keeps them from engaging with research. When they don't understand how a vaccine works, they may be less likely to go and get a vaccine in the first place, whether it's something uh, that is going to be beneficial for them or not. Um, and then there's also just the idea of understanding and knowing, knowing who's involved in carrying out that research. So when a person shows up, in a particular space and they feel alien to that space. Similar to when an individual walks into, say, a, uh, a, a doctor's office and not a single person in that doctor's office, not a receptionist, not a physician, not a physician's assistant, not even a janitor, looks like them, then they immediately feel like th that's a space that is, could be potentially threatening because no one inherently has my best interests at heart. And that's another thing that tends to come out when you have conversations with individuals in community uh, about why they wouldn't be in, engaging in any type of uh, research activity. When we design this type of healthcare outreach, educational outreach type of activities, one of the main things that we always kind of you know, try to keep in mind when we start these conversations is that the community has to be involved, obviously. Now, sometimes that's um, done better than others, but when we designed our, our approach, we were very adamant about making sure that the individual stakeholders that were involved were embedded in the community. And I say that very, very uh, uh, deliberately because there are times in which you have uh, so-called representatives of the community that aren't necessarily a part of the community in the sense that they live and they engage every single day with that same community. You'll have people who may have moved to the suburbs, but the community that they are supposedly representing is in the inner city. They're, in that, it creates a bit of a disconnect. We also know that it's important to have that partnership, a true partnership, where the stakeholders or some a portion of the stakeholders are involved in the creation of the initiative. They are important for driving the what and the how. We can't come in and tell them how, and we definitely can't do it. Um, we can't tell them what. They have to be able to define the issue and help us come up with how we're going to address it. And ultimately, as you go about doing this work, uh, what, we, what we've definitely set out to do, and we've gotten very positive feedback for this, is that we don't come in and, and kind of uh, ex exert our intellectual dominance over, over the community that we're working in partnership with. And so we remain in that guide on the side type of posturing in order to make sure that they're comfortable expressing themselves and their concerns. And we don't completely dismiss their concerns. We try to find out where they are, meet them where they are and help 
get them where they're trying to go in terms of the outcomes that we've both mutually agreed upon for this particular research. And in order for us to do this with the population that we were working with here in Duluth, we came up with a, a two-part approach, one based on education and the other based on healthcare system engagement. Now, the education piece was pretty straightforward, more or less. We came up with a series of educational modules that we would give to the populations that we were working with. Now, for us to do the study that we were doing, we needed to come up with two different cohorts, a cohort of men and a separate cohort of women that got the same educational material. And I'll go into why that's the case later. And so we covered a series of different topics based on the community's needs. Now, originally this topic, because of our, what we were really interested in when we started, was mostly focused on prostate cancer. And that's why prostate cancer had multiple sessions. However, in talking with the community in that partnership that we were talking about, we ended up having to incorporate additional diseases, additional issues that they were concerned about. And so cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mental health all became a part of it. And health access became a part, uh, health care access became an additional part when we realized more often than not, people were not wanting to engage with healthcare professionals. They just didn't want to go. It wasn't that they weren't concerned about their health, but because of negative experiences in those settings, they didn't want to go into the building because they felt a certain way based on real experience. Now, in order for us to do all of this, we recruited two additional community liaisons that would help us communicate with the community and also help us make sure that we were holding community members accountable when we set up schedules and, and calendars for the events that, that we did. The second strategy was healthcare system engagement. Again, based off of the conversations that we've had with community. And this was important because how often does a quote unquote regular person get to talk to a CEO of a hospital? How often does a, a patient get to have the full undivided attention of their physician? Not just a 10 minute spurt, but sit down, I need you to break down every word you said into terms that I understand, whatever that may be. It doesn't happen very often. One, because people tend to be pressured or they feel pressured just based on the constraints of the healthcare interaction in a, in a medical office setting. Sometimes people just don't want to feel um, like they're being uh, treated as though they're not intelligent. And so they may not ask a question that they may perceive is dumb. So we brought healthcare systems into the room. We brought all of the major healthcare systems in Duluth, uh, in the Duluth area, brought them into an open forum and had them engage with the community, have the community ask all of their questions and make sure that those questions were addressed directly. And that also led to having conversations about, well, increasing the diversity of the workforce. What, what's being done? What are the programs? What are the routes? because we know that increasing the number of people of color in those spaces in any form or fashion would improve upon some of the feelings that our community members were telling us about as we were setting up this, this particular study. And so when we did all of this, we had this idea in mind. We were looking to leverage the social interactions of the people within the community to essentially make up for the lack of black spaces. And one of the ways that we wanted to do that was to leverage the idea that African-American women and women in many cultures are the centerpiece of not just the family unit, but also the health and wellness of the family. So if you understand more about what's going on in a given situation, you're able to do more. And so what we decided to do was in that two cohort model was that the men and women got the same exact information, but the women were somehow related to each of the men. And that would allow a certain amount of kind of um, reciprocity of information. So when a man would get the information, the women would also have the same information and help implement the changes necessary in behavior that would help improve some of the health outcomes later on. And this is also just assuming and actually, we've seen it play out, but this was with the assumption based on the literature that the networks 
the, the kinship networks, the social networks of women are extensive throughout the community, wherein a lot of times men tend to have relatively small networks. And when that when you put that situation or those types of circumstances in an environment where the numbers of individuals are pretty low, that means that you have a lot of times where men are becoming extremely isolated and that isolation leads to them experiencing much worse health outcomes. And so the hypothesis of everything was basically that the women were going to help push the men towards better health if we were able to arm the women with, a, with accurate information on the various healthcare conditions that the community was experiencing. And so here's just the table kind of breaking down what we were able to do. Um, again, it's a pilot study. And the population in Duluth, Minnesota, of uh, African-American men of a certain age is relatively small. And so the numbers here aren't necessarily impressive, but the important part here was that we had a very, um, a very broad sampling in terms of the types of experiences that we were getting. The differences in education levels, the differences in ages, though most of the men tend to be older, the women, um, the women were actually a little bit more spread out uh, when it came to age and experience. And even understandably so, um, we had more women because we actually aim to recruit more women. And so that actually made the sessions very dynamic. We had a, a lot of additional information. Over here, you can kind of see a picture of some of the gentlemen who were involved in the study. Um, this picture is used with their permission, obviously, and just a breakdown of how the sessions went. And what we did before each session was do kind of a pre-assessment. And the pre-assessment gave us a kind of a baseline. And then from the, uh, from the, at the conclusion, I'm sorry, at the conclusion, of all of the sessions, we did a post-assessment for each condition in order to see how much the knowledge had improved for each of the um, for each of the topic areas. Here is kind of the cartoon schematic. This is me trying out my uh, my computer graphic skills. I'm terrible, uh, but you can kind of see the man is kind of again. This is our focal point because the focus of this study was to improve outcomes related to prostate cancer through these interventions. Um, and so we had each man to recruit at least two women that had a, a, a strong type of social interaction with. It wasn't necessarily asking for, for wives or for sisters or anything like that. It was anyone that you basically acknowledge had the ability to access you and give you information and advice that you would be willing to accept. So sometimes it ended up being mothers or it ended up being aunts, it ended up being daughters. Um, that were the folks that were being brought in, the women who were being brought in by the men. And so everyone got the same educational interventions. And so you kind of see this, again, this reciprocity of interaction. We're hoping that in doing so, we would actually end up creating a, uh, a health conscious community because each individual pod, each individual uh, 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 trifecta would end up it communicating with another group and another group and another group. And then you basically have this just amalgamation of information exchange. That's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do or what we were trying to do during the time of the pilot. So the other side of this, and this part I alluded to a little bit earlier, was that not only are we teaching uh, things related to the specific diseases, but we're teaching it in a setting that would allow the 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 guard to be down for the community we didn't ask the community to come to us we went to the community we had practicing physicians scientists healthcare professionals all teaching the content and we had them teach it in 90 minute sessions in spaces that were comfortable for the men and comfortable for the women so that we could have a honest assessment and honest conversation about what was being given to them what they didn't understand and how to make that communication better. And so this all led to us really, I think, becoming a much more effective um, intervention, but also getting to the point where we were asked to come back and we're still being asked to come back to do more, to implement more, which is at the end of the day for any researcher working in community, that's what you want. You want folks to, in, to be engaged and to want to stay engaged without doing any additional in incentives, just the fact that they thought the experience was meaningful and helpful for them. So 
we didn't have a whole bunch of data to calculate, obviously, because it was a pilot study. But here you can see what outcomes we did have based on the pre and post assessment from each of the diseases that we were educating the community on. One of the main things I wanted to focus on here was the fact that obviously coming into this particular uh, study, women had less knowledge about the prostate and prostate cancer. But you can see that at the end of the time that we worked together, and this was done over the course of about, I would say six to eight months, which unfortunately put us into the winter, um, but we got it done. We uh, see that the women had very similar uh, response rates on the, the post-assessment questionnaire as the men when it was all said and done. But you can also see that over all, each group, both the men and the women, had an improved understanding of the information based on the post-assessment um, uh, results, which indicates that we at least were able to do the job in getting the information and having people retain that information, uh, retain that information to take it forward and hopefully take it into their communities to help uh, educate others. Another thing that's important to appreciate from doing this type of work is the reality that you're going to have some additional benefits that weren't a part of the, the actual design. So one of the things that we weren't fully expecting was how many of the men just did not have any idea what their health status was. You know, th there's a lot of instances where the projection of masculinity is that you know that you have a problem, but you're too busy and too strong to deal with it. You, you break a leg and you throw some duct tape and Robitussin on it and you're okay, you're good to go. Well, actually, in many of these instances, because of the issues with engaging with healthcare professionals, a lot of the men didn't really know what their issues were. As a matter of fact, I have a story. When I was walking downtown in Duluth, because I didn't have a car at the time, so I did a lot of walking, um, one of the participants flagged me down and told me, hey, I think you guys may have saved my life. Now, when he said it, I thought he was exaggerating, but then he starts telling me, I went to my doctor and during the course of the visit, they told me if I would have come any later than this, my blood pressure would have been so high that I may not have made it to that next visit. So I'm glad you came in today. So now we can get you on your medication to bring this down and get it under control. So apparently his blood pressure was so high that he was at severe risk of, of having a, a major cardiovascular event, um, but he didn't know it. He probably had some kind of symptoms and just, again, brushed it off and kept on moving. That's what happened. The women, obviously, based on previous work, we already knew that the women wanted to help, but they didn't have the information. And so at the end of this, the women were telling us, we know more now. Now we can get on them. We can get on those guys. We can get on those, those, those sons and those nephews and get them what they need or get them to the places where they need to be. Oftentimes, especially um, with mothers or even spouses, you see that they're the ones scheduling the appointments for the men. Okay. Because the man might be too quote unquote, busy to do it. So you have these things being scheduled. And oftentimes the man isn't reluctant to go. He just doesn't want to be bothered with the details of it because it's a quote unquote hassle. So we know that this is an important thing. We know that both the men and the women were enthusiastic, as I said before, and everyone was interested in coming back to do more. A couple of quick quotes from our participants. So one of the male participants, told us most impactful was probably just being in a group of black men and talking about some actual, some real actual issues. The last part he said, hey, I'm not alone and I can actually talk about real stuff. So this, this is part of what we were kind of, un, we were unprepared for this particular bit of information because we, we thought we knew that, you know, Black folks, African-Americans in Duluth, Minnesota, are a small percentage of the population. There's a certain sense of isolation. But to hear it articulated, to hear that I never had a conversation with another Black man about my health is a very powerful statement by itself. How do we solve it? Not sure. But this is a start. This is a start because we're now creating a space where these things can happen, and it can happen and nobody thinks that it's strange, it's abnormal. 
because we don't have the barbershops. We don't have the churches. We don't have the gyms. We need a space. We need to create social interactions that allow these things to happen. One of our female participants went as far to say, and I'm not going to read her quote, but she literally described to us the idea that family ties, and this is something I grew up with myself. I don't know how many of you have aunties or cousins that are not related to you by blood or marriage. And so this particular participant reminds, reminded me that the interactions that people have with each other themselves are more important than the actual, I guess, true ties, the, the marriage ties, the blood relations. So here's a woman telling us how she has a whole neighborhood of grandkids and therefore she has a certain amount of influence on them because they're in her house, they're eating her food. She can implement and, and distribute information that could change the trajectory of a lot of these young people's lives because of those interactions. That social interaction is a major thing that we should be leveraging in order to help improve health outcomes in communities of color. Now, again, I said this earlier, I think it's important for us to understand when we are implementing some of these types of programs, these interactions, these community-based uh, research uh, initiatives, that we need to understand that the way that we are taught, trained to do things needs to have more flexibility, more flexibility than, than not. Now, obviously there are aspects of that where we can't, we can't be willy nilly when it comes to an IRB protocol, but we need to understand and be willing to go back and change that protocol when necessary to make sure that we can get the results that we're, we're trying to get. You know, we can answer the questions appropriately because it doesn't make sense for us to have a situation where we're basically measuring the intelligence of a fish by its ability to climb a tree. It's, it doesn't make sense. And so becoming flexible with our dates, our locations, even sometimes the, the objectives is important, but we would do that in partnership with communities. Social gatherings are usually a really good way of getting some of the things done. Oftentimes that's a major uh, draw for, uh, or a major device utilized for this type of work, but sometimes it's not effective and we need to be willing to accept that. Winter is so problematic for many African-Americans especially in Minnesota, because social activities diminish tremendously, interactions diminish tremendously, and it's for a number of reasons. You have to be socialized into a winter space um, appropriately. And from what we've seen, that's not something that happens very regularly, which creates a situation in which you have a limited amount of time to work with communities of color, especially African-Americans. And we ran into that where we hit the October, December months, and we couldn't work because it was so difficult for us based on how our project was set up to get all of our participants back into spaces together. And we weren't able to implement an, a virtual option. Nowadays, we may be able to do that because everything is done virtually now at, at such a high level that may be a solution, but we need to consider that. We need to consider access, not just being on the bus line because I don't know how many of you have waited in a, for a bus in the snow with a child, but it's not fun. So we, we have to think about these things, think them through and think them through with our partners in the community because they're gonna tell you, like, I'm not gonna do that. What else can we do? What are our other options? And of course, because we're looking at environments that have historically not been uh, the most hospitable for people of color, we may have to go in and help create a culture that would be welcoming for us to have these discussions, being willing to do that and being willing to do the work related to establishing that, again, should be something that researchers doing this work uh, consider before even getting started. So what are our key takeaways? So this is what we learned um, for those who do any type of community-based participatory research. I think uh, you might wanna take some of these away with you as well. Um, first and foremost, all stakeholders are not created equal. Though we did reach out and we had very good participation from a variety of stakeholders, we even had uh, community liaisons, folks who were in the community that should have been able to help us do things. We didn't realize that we were essentially having the wrong people in the wrong positions at times because there were specific individuals. As the work started getting started, we realized, oh, it's actually Miss Helen 
um, who is the go to person if you need to get people to show up. It's not this person over here who's been in charge of all these other programs in the past. It's this person over here who is more or less unassuming, but their personality it has allowed them to have a social network and a certain amount of social capital that allows them to be a, a very powerful individual within that community. And so I think it's important for us to take the time to learn these types of things and to understand it. And in order to learn that, you have to be a part of that community. You have to be in relationship with that community, not just show up when it's time to get the paper written, not just show up when you need to get a survey. Even though there were times where my colleagues and I had to drive across town to get things signed off at the last minute or have somebody do their post assessment. But no, to have conversations with these folks at the grocery store. Now, if you're a researcher and you're working with the community and you've never been to the same grocery store as them, that may be a problem. You might want to consider not being that person and be engaged in that community before working with them in order to understand the types of things that they may be referencing that are barriers, that are problems for them in their day to day life. Each community is obviously different, e though we're saying we're working with African-Americans in Duluth. That doesn't mean that what we're doing is going to work in Minneapolis. It doesn't mean it's going to work in Chicago, Detroit or New Orleans. Each community is different. They have a different language. They have a different set of values. There may be a lot of overlap, but they are unique enough that you have to respect those differences. And in order to understand those differences, you have to be in relationship with that community. So I think it's important to 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 always take that into account. And with a community like, like Duluth, we have a lot of people that are transplants from other places. So we actually have a mishmash of different you know, values coming together all at once that we have to take into account. Um, the last thing, we definitely understand how much the different messenger components play in uh, to how people are received. So sometimes racial congruence between the messenger and the, the community and the one who's receiving the message is very important. And sometimes it's not because you can actually overcome that that incongruence. Say, for instance, if you have a white uh, a physician having a conversation with a African-American patient, sometimes that can be negated or at least minimize the issues with that. If you have someone who has a very high level of emotional intelligence, understanding this person is coming to me for a particular reason, and I can understand based on understanding the spaces that they live in, that some things are being said and some things are not being said, and all of those things come to bear when we're having this exchange and not taking things literally at face value, because sometimes not being able to communicate directly is something that is normal for uh, uh, certain people in certain settings, and we have to be very aware of that. And then, like I said before about being at the grocery store, experience in the space is very important. I make sure that I'm in the grocery store where I can interact with everyone I've been doing this type of work with so that they know that I'm a real person and that I don't live on the nice side of town and only show up in, in the bad neighborhoods when I need to do some research. Future considerations for this work. Um, we definitely want to extend the work and do more in-depth sessions. We need to try to find a younger cohort because they're probably a whole different set of concerns with you know the 20 to 30 somethings that we're missing still. And so we wanna work on that. We definitely are interested in having a, even smaller cohort sizes. So breaking these groups up so that we can have longer, more in-depth interactions amongst the group and then also allowing them to develop more tighter social connections that can help them benefit them in the community outside of these, these interactions and interventions. Um, we also want to increase the interactions with the healthcare systems to, to make sure that there's more health programming going on, more education that's not tied to a paper, that's not tied to research, just making sure that information is constantly being poured in to these communities so that they understand what's going on with themselves and with power and being empowered with that information allows them to do things to uh, maintain their own health and wellness uh, without intervention. So with that, um, I just want to thank everyone involved with this work, especially Dr. Olihe Okoro in the College of Pharmacy here in Duluth. Um, she has been my number one collaborator on this work because of my, you know, wet bench background. When it comes to doing this type of work, I really did, you know, rely heavily upon her expertise um, in helping to guide this work forward. Uh, Chantel uh, Nelson was a student in my lab that Olihe and I shared. Uh, Stefan and Salam Witherspoon are both 
uh, the community liaisons that we had uh, help us out with this and also represented the NAACP um, branch here in Duluth, Minnesota. And then 100 Black Men of America Incorporated also was involved in helping us get this off the floor. And I wanna thank our funders for allowing us the funds to get this work done. And so with that, uh, hopefully I wasn't talking too fast. Uh, I'll take any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much for that, that great talk. And we're happy now to open it up for questions. You can either write them in the chat or raise your hand and I'd be, be happy to unmute you to ask it yourself. While we're waiting for questions to, to come in, I'll start out. Do you have plans to, to continue this work? Are you planning to keep working in Duluth or expanding to other areas within St. Louis County? So we, we are really interested in understanding how this can be implemented in places where a lot of the traditional uh, type of venues are available. It could mm -hmm. actually be something that can be used in combination. So as opposed to relying heavily on the physical space, you are also going to leverage the relation, the relational aspect as well. Um, so I did work during my time in, in Tennessee with clergy across the country. And unfortunately or fortunately, I, depending on how you're looking at it, we know that a lot of people are not identifying themselves as quote unquote religious as, as, as they had in the past you know, generations. Right. And so you start realizing that the church itself may not be the only way to go. It's still good, mm -hmm. but okay, you have the church. Okay, great. Now, if you notice my hair, I may not go to a barbershop very often. So, okay, for folks who go, don't go to barbershops, what are the other options? And so a multi, you know, multifaceted, multi-pronged strategy and making sure that you're leveraging as many aspects of community life as possible, I think are important. So we've actually been trying to find ways to get this to happen again, where we expand the work we're doing here and then also have a, uh, kind of a, a mirror uh, situation down in Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, first from David Largaspada. What surprised you the most about systemic barriers to health intervention in Minnesota? Um, I think from, you know, not being a native Minnesotan, um, I think the thing that surprised me the most was that for a place that generally has a really decent health grade as a state, mm -hmm. that the issues still exist, you know, because I've always seen the statistics, you know, the Southeast, you know, you have the, the stroke belt, um, you have a lot of obesity. So generally speaking, every state in the South is bad uh, from a healthcare perspective in general. Uh, but when you tend to talk about upper Midwest and particularly Minnesota, it's like, oh, you know, generally health outcomes are pretty good. But then you start looking at the specific demographics and boom, it's still there. So that actually surprised me. I was hoping that it wouldn't be the case and that this would be uh, different, but it's it's not. Yeah. Um, another question from Suzanne. Um, I'm interested in prostate cancer screening. Have you taken this research to Duluth healthcare systems to explore? prostate screenings and or education within the health system? Yes, yes we have. So we have been in conversations with Essentia and St. Luke's to figure out what they already have in place. Um, we, we've actually had conversations specifically about what they were doing already with uh, colon cancer screening and then basically telling them that approach um, is not a good idea. And let's, let's have a conversation about what matters when you're trying to engage folks that you haven't engaged already. Um, because I believe the process that they were using, um, and they still may be doing, but they basically mail out a kit and as they're expecting it to be mailed back. But if you don't already have a relationship with the person, it's a lot to ask them to send any part of their biology, even if it's excrement. Um, so, <laughs> you know, so, I, so we told them, it's like, you have to have an engagement with people first, mm -hmm. then you can ask. So in terms of prostate cancer screening, we're just trying to make sure that we bring the folks that are involved in that within the systems into the community so we can have that conversation and ease people into it. Um, because it's very rare for a person who's against it to all of a sudden just say, yes, I want to do it. It's, it's no matter what you throw at them, it, they have to become comfortable with who's going to ultimately do it in some way if you want to see that reliably happen. 
Yeah, for sure. Especially when it just comes in the mail. <laughs> exactly. Um, the next question from um, Sue Everson Rose. Um, as a bench scientist, what was the most surprising part of this research for you? The complexity. The complexity was the most surprising part. Um, as a bench scientist, we do tend to operate in a certain realm of reductionism. We simplify things as much as possible, and then we try to make it, you know, extrapolate it to the more complicated um, biology. Uh, but no, this is on a whole nother level comparatively. I think understanding the dynamics of, again, the weather, the, the topography, you know, for those who've been to Duluth, Duluth is a one ginormous hill. And knowing that that actually played a role in whether or not people would show up, because if they had to walk uphill, they're not going to show. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was very interesting. I mean, it was it, it, it's it's a strategy based RPG like nobody's business uh, for those who play games. Um, so I think that was really surprising. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question about the slides and recording. And yes, the, the recording will be shared on the Cancer Center website. So Dr. Simmons has given permission to, to have his seminar shared widely, so. Jen, Dougie has, a, has his hand up. I'll allow him to talk. Okay, great. Yeah, hi, I, I could have typed it in, but it was a, there's sort of a two-part question. Glenn, that was great. And I wonder if you can um, give us some tips on how you engaged your healthcare system. Because, you know, I think that that's a challenge uh, in a lot of respects um, because it does require some time and changing and procedures on their part, potentially. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's the first part of the question. But I have a second okay. question if, you, if we have time, but go ahead with that one. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be short with this part then. Um, luckily for us, our healthcare systems were already trying. So we knew who to go to, to kind of push the, uh, you know, to push what we needed, you know, up the, up the chain, so to speak. Um, the, the first thing I think is really just having a very clear objective for them, something that they could do. Now we didn't tell them that they had to heal everybody in, in the community or they had to do free health care because obviously that would be impossible. But the ask was really small. Show up to the table. Have people in the conversation that can actually speak to the problems that we, we are listing. And we tried our best to lay that out for them. And they showed up. But again, they were already in a position where they wanted to show up, which helped us tremendously. So it may have even seemed like we did something Herculean, but we just if the timing was just right for us and we laid out a very simple ask and when they came to the table, they were receptive. And since then we've had more community engagement than we've ever had before okay. with the health systems. Yep. Great, thanks. The second part of the question was kind of unrelated. Um, during COVID times, how easy or hard is it to build the relationships that you outlined? I think your points were very well taken. The relationships are incredibly important. But if we can't do this face to face, does this work in the communities we want to reach to do this virtually or or not? That's that's ex absolutely. So we've implemented um, this isn't part of this work, but we've implemented uh, a couple of nonprofits and spinoffs of the nonprofit. Um, so we have a, a project called Healthy. Uh, I'm sorry, Health Equity Northland. And so we've been doing covid related seminars, live seminars. We call them office hours. So we'll have some healthcare professional scientists or what have you come in and it's free to the public. We record them and then we send it back out. And the attendance has not been ideal based on the amount of canvassing that we've been doing. And we do the canvassing, you know, face to face because we have people that live in the community. So they're going to be there anyway. But um, yeah, it's it's tremendously difficult on the virtual side of things because we are already used to it. We're just turning up the, the dial, right? We're, we're used to being in front of a computer anyway. For individuals who don't access a computer except for entertainment, for instance, it's probably not gonna happen. Having them you know, do this on the phone, it's frustrating. So you, you, it's, it, you basically have to, again, you have to create the culture first and then you can utilize the tools that come with that culture, that value system that, that's embedded within that. But COVID has basically forced us 
to use tools with no underlying culture. And so a lot of times um, the communities that we have been working with here are not able to show up. We have a major community-wide event happening in October and the speaker we were bringing in is this nationally regarded author. And that's one of our major concerns is that we won't be able to get people to log in. Even though it's free, there's gonna be food involved. The food will be at a physical space so they can come and pick it up and then take it wherever they wanna be. But we're scared that we're not going to get people to show up because again the culture of being electronic with your communication is still not really um it's not settled in yet okay thanks all right jen do we i think that's the end of our questions all right great well thank you again so much for the excellent presentation and all the tips that you've shared we look forward to hearing more about your research in the future. And Thanks, I, Thanks for having me. Thank you, Glenn, so much. I, and I would like to just reach out to everybody who's still there and say we are finally going to go post-COVID live with our seminar next week. And so we'll be meeting in CCRB live with, uh, with uh, Kaylee Schwarfeger giving our, our first live Masonic Cancer Center seminar. So we look forward to seeing everybody again. So thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks a lot.